You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Listening to Cheese and Packers, a project powered by Packernet Podcast Network. I'm your host, JJ Leahy. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so, today we are doing next week's podcast. Had a little schedule shakeup. I had a guest for today. Um, that ended up falling through. And then um, I was in talks with another guest who I wanted to have come on this week. And that the timing just didn't work out for him, so we're gonna have him on next week, uh, and that's gonna be a fantastic conversation. So that's gonna be John Meerdink. He's the host of Blue Fifty Eight, um, of the Power Sweep. Super smart guy. Love his content. We're gonna be talking with John about uh, later round draft prospects that make a lot of sense for the Packers to lock into, um, and. He's got a really good track record for um, for his um, methodology, <laughs> which we're going to talk about next week, about how he locks in on these guys. John has um, correctly honed in on a, a few dudes in the last couple of years who I think I think Kylan Hill was one of them. I know Jonathan Garvin was one where he IDs these guys who are you know projected as like sixth, seventh round picks, maybe undrafted territory. And they end up with the Packers. He's got a re- really good methodology. We're going to get into that. That's going to be a blast. I was really hoping to do that today. Um, but we're going to have him next week. So uh, there's some news. So you got the whole Debo thing going on. Um, Dude, I don't, I don't even know what to say. Everybody thinks we're going to get Debo. <laughs> um, count me out of that one, man. Look, even if the 49ers want to trade him and even if the price that they want for Debo is, you know, something that in your mind is really affordable and makes sense, like a first and a third or something like that, which is, by the way, you know, basically what we got for Devante. So would you have done a one for one Devante for Debo swap? Maybe you would. Maybe that might be your evaluation of Debo. But even even if that's your evaluation of what the Niners want for Debo. I promise you that's not what they want from the Packers for Debo. Promise you. The 49ers would rather do business with just about anybody other than Green Bay. I think that probably the order of ranking for them is number one, we will not do business with um, who like the Seahawks now the Seahawks suck right now. So Cardinals, they will not do business with the Cardinals or the Rams and then it's the Seahawks. And then after that, I I can't think of a single team. It would be other than the Packers, the 49ers and the Packers face each other in the playoffs. I mean, golly, it feels like every single year, no chance. The Niners want to trade one of the players that they consider a superstar to a team that they're going to have to face in the playoffs every single year. They don't want to do it. So the only way the Packers are going to get Debo is if they massively overpay for him. I'm just saying. Maybe that's worth it to you. Maybe it's worth two first-round picks for Debo to you. I'm just saying there's other teams out there who have a lot of resources who are going to be wanting in on Debo if he actually is going to get traded. The only way the Packers leapfrog that line and get in front is if they massively overpay Think of, you know, (laughs) the deal that just went down for Deshaun Watson to Cleveland. If you looked at that and you felt like, wow, the Browns are really lucky that they were able to land Deshaun Watson in that trade. You are out of your mind. The Browns were offering the most compensation for Deshaun by a mile. And that's why they got him. 
They overpaid for Deshaun. We would have to overpay for Debo. So, uh, other news. Tom Silverstein quoted uh, Devondre Campbell, who was talking to the media. Uh, Devondre Campbell said he made it known to the Packers last year he was a Mike linebacker and he didn't want to be used all over the place like in previous stops. They agreed and signed him and it paid off. He said he knew if he could play one spot, he would flourish. We've, we've heard him say similar things to this before. But that's kind of encouraging that the Packers are, you know, listening to that kind of feedback from players. Um, I like hearing that. That's that's good news. And uh, if you listen to my podcast, No Huddle Radio, uh, over on Packers Talk with Gil Martin, we talked about, you know, at the time when we signed Devondre, well, two things happened. First of all, I freaked out about how much we paid him because I <laughs> I thought we paid him too much money then, which, you know, in hindsight is laughable. But, you know, at the time he had never done anything. But uh, Gil and I were looking at Devondre as a player historically, what he's done, looking at his physical gifts. And we thought, you know, it seems like he has been asked to do a lot of goofy stuff he's always dropping into coverage constantly that never makes any linebacker look good he might be a lot better than his past stats would indicate and that ended up being the case and looks like Devondre suspected that all along it's nice to hear the Packers listen to that and it would be nice to see going forward if they continue to take feedback from players I do wonder a little bit if this had anything to do with the Aaron Rodgers situation and how frustrated he and Devontae were with the team. That is totally possible. Um, Don't know. It's all speculation, but thought that was interesting. Okay, real quick, got to take a sponsor break, get that out of the way, and then we're going to dive into the meat of what we're doing, and it's going to be a blast. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details i'm a little bit prematurely doing next week's podcast today and that is breaking down my big board. I'm just going to be up front. Some of the picks that I have, you're going to hate. <laughs> you're going to go, man, that, that guy's not, uh, you know, he's not a top 10 pick on any mock draft I've seen. He's not a first rounder on any mock draft I've seen. And that's fine. Um, you know what? There's uh, it, this. This is part of draft analysis is. You do your own homework, you come up with the players that make the most sense to you, and then you need to just tune out the outside noise and don't just give in to peer pressure 
if you don't have a good reason to move a guy up your board. Um, and look, every year players fall in the draft um, way further than the uh, media thought they would. They get taken way earlier than the media thought they would. Do those guys always end up panning out? Uh, you know, not so much. I think that certainly the earlier in the draft you look, the more consistency you find in between um, what we all think is going to happen and what teams actually do. And that's because, you know, that's where the best players are, that it's the easiest for everybody to, everybody to agree, yeah, they're really great. So, I mean, I think by the time you get in the second round, for sure, there's just a lot of questions. And I think we don't always take into consideration <laughs> how messed up the second round is if you're trying to compare it to all the big boards and, and mock drafts that you've seen. So uh, I did do a shakeup. The last adjustment I made here was to safety. Um, previously, I was really low on Kyle Hamilton. Now, I liked what I had seen from him when I watched his games. I thought he looked fantastic. But anytime I was messing with the numbers, I couldn't get him into my top tier of safeties. He was like actually really low. I think I think for a long time he was like safety number 11 for me. And I felt like I was just really missing something. And today um I went ahead and regraded my safeties through all my old numbers. And I graded them using the same process I used for cornerback. And this time uh the numbers definitely looked a lot different. Um the big difference uh, of course, was run defense is a much lower priority for me for corners than it is for safeties. And the funny thing is that when I took run defense out of the mix entirely or added it in, nobody on the board moved at all except Kyle Hamilton. <laughs> so if you took run defense out, he was um, neck and neck for a nearly razor thin tie for first place. Um, when I add the uh, run defense back in, then he drops substantially. So what I ended up doing is I weighted run defense a lot lighter than everything else. Because, he, he, you know, safety is a defensive back position. Do I want anybody to be good against the run? Yes. And if you are neck and neck with a couple other guys, I am going to drop you down a little bit. Um, if you're the only one with a bad run defense grade. He is a good tackler, so I factored that in as well. So Kyle Hamilton does come in as my safety number two. Now, he's not a top ten prospect for me, but he is comfortably within the first round on my board. So uh, I think this is going to be fun. I will also say there is a position group on here that I really have not evaluated yet. Um, aside from special teamers, I'm not doing kickers, punters, or long snappers. If you care about those, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just not wasting <laughs> more of my time on this stupid big board just to include those guys. Um, but defensive tackle is a position that I just have not done. So what I did is I took the rankings for defensive tackle for a couple of people who I think are really good. Um, and, uh, you know, combined those, one of those was Ryan's, I put his defensive tackle, uh, rankings in here. So those are the numbers we're using for defensive tackle and yeah, I just haven't watched them. So, uh, Trayvon Walker therefore is def has definitely fallen considerably, uh, because I'm not giving him any special weight for his. Uh, extreme athleticism or anything. When I look at, uh, if I grade him out as an edge rusher, he's one of the worst edge rushers in the entire draft. If I stick him at defensive tackle, he comes in at number one overall. So, um, and I think that he needs to play defensive tackle anyways, but you know, you got questions of, is he a tweener? He, his production in college was terrible. You're drafting him entirely based on athletic ability and upside and hoping he turns into something and, and reaches his full potential. I asked Ryan about him and he said, yeah, Trayvon Walker is basically Rashawn Gary 2.0. Um, <laughs> worse grades 
or uh, worse, um, worse production in college, but a higher ceiling based on his athletic ability. So, so Trayvon Walker is prospect number twenty on my board because I'm not grading him on any kind of a curve for uh, all that upside. So, apologies for the uh, defensive line enthusiasts. You're not going to like this. <clears throat> Um, let's see, wide receiver, I think you guys will be more or less okay with wide receiver. I had to, had to keep tweaking my rankings, because for a while, wide receiver kept falling, like, the first wide receiver would go off the board around, like, pick 20, and I'm like, alright, that that's, e- even if this is how I think it, or think, uh, you know, my an assessment of these guys would stack up. This is just not even realistic for the first wide receiver to be taken at pick 20. That's just not going to happen. So I did tweak that around and we have uh number t- pick number 10 is our first wide receiver. So here's what I'm going to do. I have loaded up a mock draft on the draft network and I let it just auto pick everybody up to uh, the Packers. And here's what I want you to do. Pretend that my big board is Brian Gudikin's big board. Have you seen Goody's board? Do you know how he has these guys ranked? Me neither. So, don't get mad at my ranking. Pretend that this is exactly Gudikin's ranking. We ran through um, the first 21 picks in the draft. No trades. And I'm going to show you who we have on my board, uh, who's, who's available to take and where they are on my board. And what I have done is I've broken up the players into tiers. So at pick 22, what we're hoping is that at least one player from tier one is available. And there are seven players in tier one. Aiden Hutchinson, Evan Neal, Ahmad Gardner, Kayvon Thibodeau, Bernard Raymond, Charles Cross, and Ikema Kwanu. Those That's my tier one. You probably have a very different Tier 1. That's fine. We're pretending that this is Gudekun's Tier 1 as well. So the question is, are any of those guys still on the board? Actually, yes. You probably know who it is because you probably didn't like hearing this guy's name in Tier 1. Anyways, Bernard Raymond. (laughs) So Bernard Raymond is uh, my fifth highest player in the draft. He's my tackle 2. He is still available at pick 22. If I'm Brian Gudekunst, I am over the moon excited about this. Now, incidentally, uh, let's see, 22. If you look at the number of guys I have in my tier two, which is, all right, um, I could take any of these guys kind of in any order and be okay with it, but I would not take anybody who's in tier three ahead of anybody who's on the list at tier two, okay? Okay. Tier two is uh, 20, it's uh, it's 18 players. So if you add my two tiers together, that actually is a higher number than 22, which means there's no chance that every player from tier one and every player from tier two are gone by pick 22. So for me, the only reason I would be interested in trading up is if a player from tier one has fallen. Um well past the uh you know that number of picks and we're getting close to my pick so in theory i would probably have traded up for bernard raymond um but we're not doing a trade today so if ever if i were to take bernard raymond here that would be the last guy out of uh tier one and i am going to go ahead and take him and we're going to see uh who is available for our next pick All right, so guys are flying off the board. Now, one thing that's happening here is guys on my board in the 40s, 50s, 60s, a guy in the 90s, they're all getting taken right now in the first round. That's going to happen in the actual draft. Now, are they going to be flying off, you know, in the 90s according to, like, the uh, consensus mock drafts that you've seen? Probably not in the first round. However... That is going to be happening for some teams that they'll be like, yeah, I just don't see it with this guy. I got him as a third round prospect. Ryan did a, an episode, um, I don't know, probably two weeks ago now. He was reading off uh, quotes from actual NFL scouts 
talking to Bob McGinn. And he was talk they were talking about guys that you think of as a consensus first round pick, and there were individual scouts for NFL teams saying, Yeah, I don't get it. This guy is gonna be a bust. Um I, I wouldn't take him any earlier than the fourth round. Okay, got these scouts were saying that. So this is <laughs> this is what their boards look like. Uh, so when I have a guy like Derek Stingley way outside of the first round, am I wrong about that? Yeah, I might be, but there's other teams that have players that you think of in the same caliber of Derek Stingley way outside the first round. So we are on the clock. Uh, we missed out on, cause I know you care about wide receivers. We missed out on two wide receivers in between our two picks. And that was Jahan Dotson. I'm sorry, three. Jahan Dotson, Chris Olave, and Traylon Burks. Those were all taken in between our two picks. So we did miss out on a pile of wide receivers. If you're curious, before our pick 22, Jamison Williams was taken, uh, Drake London, and Garrett Wilson. So those were the three uh, first three wide receivers off the board. Now, this is an interesting spot for us to be in. So, like I said, I have more than 22 players in my top um, two tiers. So, we had multiple tier two, we had a ton of tier two prospects available at pick 22, and we even had a tier one prospect available at 22, and we took him. So now, when you're looking at, um, when we're on the clock at pick 28, there's a bunch of guys available from my tier two. We'll go through them. Uh, Desmond Ritter is here. Um, let's see. Lewis Seen. Kyler Gordon, the cornerback. Matt Corral. Uh, Jalen Petrie. Kirby Joseph, another safety. Um, let's see. Is Kenyon Green... Kenyon Green is the final player in my tier two. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players that we can choose from here. They're all tier two. Now, if I was a slave to my draft board and a slave to, we have to take the best player available no matter what, we would take Desmond Ritter. I'm not doing that. I'm also not a slave to, well, what's the, what's the second best guy on here? Remember, I chunked these up into tiers. So while I do think that uh, Desmond Ritter is a better prospect than Lewis Seen, and I think that Lewis Seen is a better prospect than Kyler Gordon, it doesn't mean I have to take them in that order. I do have to take them in the order of their tiers. So if there was another offensive tackle available from Tier 1, doesn't matter I took Bernard Raymond already, I'm taking that other offensive tackle from Tier 1 with my next pick because I'm just not passing up on that kind of talent. And I'm saying there's nobody available in tier two who I would be willing to take over one of the guys in tier one. However, within that tier, I have some flexibility to go after guys who are of a greater positional need to me. So um, one thing you'll notice that's going to be disappointing. There's no wide receivers available in tier two. This is, I think, the situation that the Packers found themselves in 2020. Now, you have to ask yourself, in 2022, are they desperate enough for wide receiver help that they would ignore their tiers? I think it's at least on the table to ask that question. So the next wide receiver available is a tier three guy for me. That is George Pickens. Uh, he is number 28 on my big board. And then after that, there is not another wide receiver until, wow, this has been picked over. Alec Pierce at 57. Now, the odds that uh, either one of those guys makes it to 57 when there are no wide receivers left anywhere in between now and 57. Look, there's other teams who want wide receivers. If I want a wide receiver, I'm going to have to reach. And I think this is my definition of reaching, is if you reach out of your tier for a guy who's not in the current tier that you're in. All right. You have tier, you have a lot of tier two guys available and you're reaching for a tier three guy because you're saying I'm desperate for help at this position. So if we take George Pickens here, 
here's who we say, we're saying no to. We're saying no, no to two quarterbacks, Desmond Ritter and Matt Corral. I think you're probably okay with doing that. You know, I have those quarterbacks ranked as my number eight and number 17 best players in this draft. All right, so we're not talking about uh, Joe Burrow here. Consensus number one overall. <sighs> Do I believe that Matt Corral or uh, Desmond Ritter could turn into great starting NFL quarterbacks? Yeah, I think that's that's a, a an option for them. But am I willing to take a quarterback here when I already have Jordan Love sitting on the bench? It's just not a big enough need for me to take a guy here. Now, if either of these guys are available at my first, second round pick, that's too much value for me to say no to. I don't think either guy is going to make it there. I think they're both going to be t- taken in the first round, maybe even in this mock draft where we're not even where we're you know we're just following the draft network's um, board. But if either of those guys are available at 53, I am taking them at 53 and maybe trading up for one of them earlier than 53. But we're going to pass on quarterback here. So you have safety options. we got three safety options. Lewis Seen, Jalen Petrie, and Kirby Joseph that are all available here. We will be passing up on one of those three guys for George Pickens. Now, who would I rather have just straight up, Lewis Seen or George Pickens? I'd rather have Lewis Seen. However, let's look at safety depth in this draft. If we want to get a safety, there's a bunch of options in between now and our our next uh, wide receiver, Alec Pierce. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, eight, and almost nine. Actually, there's two safeties back to back there. So eight safeties in between now and when Alec Pierce is on the board. And then if you include just the two picks right after that, we got 10 safeties. So we're talking about 10 safeties that I'd be happy with taking compared to um, just two wide receivers. You're making a pretty good case here for reaching for a wide receiver. Would I reach for a tier four wide receiver? Absolutely not. I'm not reaching from tier two to tier four. I don't care how desperate we are for a wide receiver. I'm not sure there's a position in football that I would reach two tiers for. Inside offensive lineman, the only guy we have available is Kenyon Green. Would I rather have Kenyon Green or George Pickens? Well, again, let's see. Looking at other interior guys, there's not much in the way of interior linemen, but we did already take a tackle here. So all of a sudden offensive line is a lower priority to me than it would have been if I hadn't taken Bernard Raymond. So the last guy, well, we're we're passing up on Kyler Gordon, but we have a lot of cornerback depth. So I'm okay with maybe passing on a cornerback that I really believe in. And we're passing up on Nick Benito, edge rusher. And there are still quite a few edge rushers left. So I am going to go ahead and reach for George Pickens here. I I, I wanted to walk through this exercise so you see, you know, how this board stacks up. And I think that if you want to draft some wide receivers, you're going to have to almost certainly reach outside of your tier. And you're taking a wide receiver who you're saying, I don't think that this is as good of a football player as any of the other guys that I have on the on the board here. But it's such a limited commodity that if I want one, I have to take one here. So would Gutekunst do this? I think he would, you know, depending on, on, you know, what his opinion was of the wide receiver. But we're pretending that this is his board. Would he reach for a wide receiver here? I think he would. I think there's a good enough case to be made positionally for each of the guys available here for why you would be okay with with passing on them. And I'm you know, I'm not sure what position group I would say you couldn't do that with in this scenario. I think it really is a case of the wide receivers that are available who are in because there's no tier two wide receivers available here. All we have are why uh, uh Tier 3, 
and where's Alec Pierce on my board? So Alec Pierce actually comes in as a tier four player. So he's the, so George Pickens is the only tier three wide receiver that is on this board. So, um, that's how you, that's how you get to the conclusion that you're going <laughs> to, you're going to reach. Um, and, and I, I don't really care about where a guy is at on the consensus big boards for like, Oh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to go until the fourth round. So that was a reach. Cause you took him in the third round. That's not my definition of a reach. My definition is you are locked in on a guy that you like positionally and you're reaching out of a tier of better players that you believe are better for this guy just so you can have a guy at that position. So so uh, I'm going to take an ad break real quick here and then we're going to wrap up uh, the rest of this draft. And uh, it's only going to be a... a three round draft um so and we're not going to spend as much time on uh, rounds two and three as we did on round one but i wanted to kind of walk you through that process and how that works because i think that's exactly how it's going to work for the packers is i you know you got these players chunked up into tiers and i think those tiers really matter so but i wanted to go through two examples here so you can see how that comes together and and if there were more wide receivers available I think that I would have stuck to my guns and not reached for that position. And I would have said, you know what? Would have been nice to grab one of my top wide receiver prospects, but we'll grab a guy on day two. So the reason we reached is because the way this board looks right now, there's not going to be anyone on day two. Because we're already into the late 50s, almost into the 60s um, of wide receivers. And we have a whole round to go before we're back on the clock. So at that point, you're going to be in the second round and saying, well, we only have tier five and six and seven wide receivers left. So, um, so that's why we reached is because of the scarcity at this position. And because there's just one single guy there who we feel is any kind of an option. So, um, you know, and, and would you be willing to trade up? Um, you know, maybe that's another option. Maybe you look at, Hey, uh, rather than taking a guy or, uh, you know, re- rather than take reaching for Pickens, we take, say, Lewis scene right now, even though there are a bunch of other safeties available who would be acceptable options. Or you take Kenyon Green because he's the only uh, interior offensive lineman left in any of our high tiers and then try and trade up to grab um, Pickens. And maybe that is an option because. Because uh, the Packers did that last year with Josh Myers and Amari Rogers. So, uh, something to consider. All right, ad break here, and we'll be right back. So, one of the really nice things is what I'm going to call fluff. You got guys who are not even on my board who are being taken by these teams in the second round. For example, linebacker Quay Walker. I just didn't see anything I liked with him. He was not impressive enough to me to put him anywhere on my big board. Then you got guys who I have ranked in the 90s. We had uh, my uh, prospect number 99, in fact, was Perrion Winfrey, and he went... uh, Who took him here? He went early. Yeah, he was the first pick of the second round. Pick 33 of the Jaguars. You know what? Great for him. Happy for him. I don't want him on my team. If the Packers draft him, I'm going to have to dig deep and really learn to love him and and find some positives about him, but I don't think he's that good. So he had a lot of fluff taking up a lot of room. A bunch of quarterbacks are going off the board, and that's nice. You got players who are falling. We're back on the clock. Now, if you're curious, so what wide receivers were taken after George Pickens but before we're back on the clock? Because remember... I didn't say there were no wide receivers, period. I said there was no wide receivers who I had ranked highly, that I, meaning, you know, pretend Brian Gutekunst, um, thought were worth taking. So, let's see, uh, George Karloftis went, uh, Daxton Hill, Lewis Seen. Uh, first wide receiver taken was Sky Moore to the Browns at 44. All right. And then that's it. No other wide receivers were taken. So 
you know, there was kind of a void of wide receiver talent here. And if you're curious what wide receivers are left, period, in this draft, we got Alec Pierce, John Mechie, Calvin Austin, Christian Watson, David Bell, Eric Ezekanma, and Kevin Austin Jr. Those are the remaining wide receivers that I have as top 100 prospects. I'm sure you think Christian Watson is amazing and you would want to take him right here. Um, that's not where I ranked him, and that's fine. We can disagree about that. Um, the question is, what tiers of prospects are available at pick 53 here? Well, the top guy on the board is Matt Corral. <laughs> uh, Matt Corral available. He's my 17th highest rated prospect. Available at 53. Also available is Nick Benito. Sam Howell, we got a second quarterback. Brian Cook, the safety. Tackle Sean Ryan. Tackle Abraham Lucas. Um, edge rusher Logan Hall. Um, those are kind of the remaining big names that you guys would all definitely know. So, uh, at 17, um, where is he? 17. So, Matt Corral is solidly a Tier 2 prospect. Um... Anybody else? Nick Benito? Nick Benito is outside of Tier 2. He is actually our first Tier 3 player. So we have one Tier 2 player available, and then we have a pile of Tier 3 guys and some Tier 4 guys available. Let's see. Who's our earliest Tier 4 guy? Tier 4, let's start with uh, Kobe Bryant. So we actually have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 tier three players available and one tier two player. So according to my system here, we have to take Matt Corral. Now in the interest of you guys having fun listening to this podcast, I'm not going to take Matt Corral here, but just know if I was the GM of a football team and my job was not to be entertaining, but to build the best possible football team, I'm taking Matt Corral right here. So uh, I'm not going to do that to you guys because I know you'd hate it, but that is who I would take. <laughs> so your next guy on the board here is Nick Benito. Uh, we're not taking Sam Howell for the same reason we didn't take Matt Corral. Brian Cook, safety out of Cincinnati. That would be a good get. Uh, then we have a couple of uh, offensive linemen and a couple more safeties. So here's the question. Well, you know, and this is also where the run on linebackers starts on my board. I actually have... Uh, three straight linebackers here because uh, I think and I think it was four on my original board. We're all right in a row, but Devin Lloyd's already been taken by uh, who took him? Devin Lloyd. He was taken in the first round at pick twenty six to the Titans. Okay, so I'm going to read off these positions. I'm going to skip quarterback. Ready? Edge, safety, tackle, tackle, edge, safety, safety. Linebacker, 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 um, and cornerback. So those are the uh, guys left in Tier 3. And if you look at edge rushers outside of Tier 3, it is a steep drop-off. In fact, not sure how many of these names you guys would even recognize. So obviously we have Drake Jackson out of USC. I think most people do know Drake Jackson. Isaiah Thomas, Oklahoma. Uh, that's, you know, he's pretty far down on like the consensus big board, but I like him a lot. Uh, I didn't have any problem putting him there. Uh, let's see. My Jay Sanders and Sam Williams. These are all our tier four guys and Kingsley and Ibarre. So, you know, not, not horrific prospects, but Nick Benito is clearly in a different tier. I am going to go ahead and take Nick Benito. So our first three picks taken are. Um, offensive tackle, wide receiver, and edge rusher. We're back on the clock at 59. This time, who do we miss out on? Cornerback T Cam Taylor Britt. That's fine. He wasn't even in my top 100. Christian Watson was taken. So that's another wide receiver off the board. Uh, two offensive linemen, Dylan Parham and Sean Ryan. And Nicobe Dean was taken. All right, we're pretending that Matt Corral and Sam Howell are not here because, like I already said, not doing that to you guys. Gutekunst might, and I think 
probably should, but will he? Um, or, I mean, will I? No, I won't. That's why I didn't have an answer for will he. I was like, wait, what is the answer? What what question am I trying to ask? Okay. So, uh, Brian Cook, the safety, is then the next highest guy on my board. Um, but, again, there's still a pile of safeties. And if you want a wide receiver... Um, remember, we're not going to be on, we're only going to be on the click, uh, on the clock one more time in these first three rounds. And that is f- almost 40 picks from now, uh, 35 picks for now. Um, Alec Pierce is the remaining wide receiver from my tier, whatever this is, tier four. Uh, and then it's a long, long way until, uh, the 82 best prospect on my board, John Mechie. So, it's a question of are we going to take more than one wide receiver in this draft? You either I think you either take a safety now, you maybe take a linebacker or another offensive tackle. There's no guards available around here that are high on my board. Surprising number of tackles, but no guards. Looks like there was a run on, on guards, actually, a little bit earlier in this draft. Um, took a lot, a lot of the guys I liked. So, you're looking at safety... Uh, not really any fantastic edge rushers in between us and Alec Pierce. Uh, a couple of cornerbacks, but none of them are my top prospects at cornerback. You got Christian Harris and Leo Chanel. Actually, that's an interesting one. Let's just sort this by only linebacker. Um, yeah, if you want to take a linebacker, you're going to have to take one of these two guys, I think. Um, now, there's also Channing Tindall and Brian Asamoa, who I have in the 70s. So either of those would be really great value at 90. And I think, uh, you know, maybe decent odds that one of those guys are there. But again, I think you're looking at you got you have a clear drop off after your next wide receiver. Because for perspective, so you got Alec Pierce and then a drop off to John Mechie and Calvin Austin. A little bit more of a drop off. And then David Bell, Eric Ezekama and Kevin Austin Jr. Those are the only wide receivers in my top 100. So... Um, you're saying there's a total of six wide receivers that you'd be happy to take in the first three rounds here, or I should say, um, with your third round pick, uh, versus four linebackers, uh, six edge rushers, one running back, just one tight end, four tackles, three guards. So actually offensive line is kind of one of your, uh, your thin positions here. Still a pile of safeties. There's Brian Brian Cook clearly separates himself from everybody else. Then you got uh big drop off to Brad Hawkins, Leon O'Neill, Marquise Bell, Nick Cross, Tyson Anderson, and Smoke Monday, who are all in between about 40 and 60. Um do, 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 cornerbacks. Yeah, not really a quarterback. Cornerbacks worth discussing. Uh, edge rushers. We already took one edge rusher. The remaining edge rushers, the top guy here is Logan Hall, who was our 42nd best player, and we were at pick 59. So, again, good value. So, you're looking at uh, 49 for, or, sorry, 42 for Logan Hall versus 57 for Alec Pierce. And looking at my tiers, I have, uh, let's see. So Logan Hall is comfortably a tier three prospect and Alec Pierce is just barely a tier four prospect. And there's no other wide receivers in tier four. I mean, there are, but they've already been drafted. Like, uh, for example, Jahan Dotson, I have in tier four as well. He's just just behind Alec Pierce. If we look forward a bit to tier five for wide receiver, there's John Mechie and Calvin Austin would be the next um, guys available. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure the listeners want me to take a wide receiver and I'm, I'm fine with taking a wide receiver. But if you're looking at who who is the, the highest guys available here, you're looking at, at Brian Cook and a pretty significant drop off after that to the next um, safety who I think is worth taking. And then tackle is similar. So we're at pick 59. So anything with a number smaller than 59 is going to be a good value that we're happy about. Because we're saying that, uh, you know, that, that we think this guy should have gone earlier than 59. We're getting him here. 
Abraham Lucas at tackle, but we already have a tackle in this draft. Uh, there's linebackers available. I think I'd rather have a safety than a linebacker. We already took an edge rusher, and our next edge is uh, Logan Hall at 42 or Drake Jackson at 51. I think I'm taking Brian Cook here, but the idea of taking Alec Pierce is really, really appealing. However, I already reached once for wide receiver, so wide receiver is not as big of a need as it was before we took George Pickens with our our um, second first-round pick. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just stick to the tiers. We're taking Brian Cook at 59, and then it's going to be a long time before we're back on the clock again. And the media is going to be mad about this one, by the way, because Brian Cook is the Draft Network's player 106, and we're taking him at 59. Now, does that feel like a Packers move to take a guy who the media is way lower on? Absolutely. They do that every year. And you know what? Seems to work out for him pretty frequently. A.J. Dillon. (laughs) Think about the PFF guys laughing because A.J. Dillon wasn't even on their board and the Packers took him. You know what? That's panned out pretty well. I think you're not too mad about them drafting A.J. Dillon. All right, we're back on the clock at 92. A lot of guys taken. It was painful watching all these guys coming off the board. (laughs) Uh, As far as uh, wide receivers, because I know that's what everybody cares about, David Bell is gone. John Mechie. Uh, Matt Corral finally went at 67, but we're pretending he went a lot earlier than that. Uh, That's it for wide receiver. Isaiah Likely was taken. Um, so he went at pick 81. So he was like my number, I think he was my 100th best player on my board. Um, I, I don't love this, uh, this tight end class. It's, it's fine. There's, there's some guys I really like, but overall, I don't think, feel like the top, the top end talent is really there. A couple guys taken that I think are not good. Um, Tyreek Smith, well outside of my top 100 players, Damari Mathis, the safety, definitely not on my board. Um, Zachary Carter, tackle out of Florida. Darian Beavers, linebacker out of Cincinnati. So those are some of the guys who were taken, um, who I was not not big on. So Sam Howell is is technically still here, but we're pretending he was already taken. So the next guys up are two safeties, Brad Hawkins and Leon O'Neal. Kobe Bryant, the cornerback out of Cincinnati, is up next. That's Sauce Gardner's running mate. Another quarterback, Bailey Zappi, Western Kentucky. So we're in an interesting position here because we have several Tier 3 players left. Again, we're not counting Sam Howell. Uh, Where is Bailey Zappi? Bailey Zappi is in my Tier 4. So, But we do have Brad Hawkins, Leon O'Neal. Um... Those are the two remaining tier three guys. And then, um, let's see, Kobe Bryant is in tier four. Uh, Alec Pierce and Bailey Zappi. See, this is an interesting one. Alec Pierce is still here. We were debating taking him at our previous pick. We passed on him. He's still available at pick 92. Not something we thought was going to happen at all. Do I think Alec Pierce is going to make it to pick 92 Uh, In real life, I do not. The draft network projects him to go around pick 127. I don't think I'd buy that, but okay. I think it's funny that we're using uh, the draft network's predictive board, and they're not even following their own predictive board. Like, I'm not talking about like, oh, you know, there's a guy here or there, you know, a player was projected for pick 40 and he went at 45. No, literally, they have Sam Howell. Uh, They predict that he will go. This is the Draft Network's predictive board. That's what it's called. They predict he will go at pick 45. We're at pick 92, and he's still here. So is Calvin Austin, 75, Channing Tindall, 80, K. Dotton, 81, Jeremy Rucker, 82. I just think it's funny. They're calling it a predictive board, and then they're not even following it. So here's the question. Do we take a safety here? Because we got two tier two safeties, but we just took a safety uh, who we thought was much better in. uh, What was his name? Brian Cook. Totally spaced for a second there. Couldn't remember anybody we had drafted. So we got two tier two. Tier three, two, two tier three safeties. Um, 
and we had taken a tier two safety already. Or just a couple picks later is Alec Pierce. I think I'm okay with going Pierce here since we already took a safety and these are the only guys in our tier three is just a couple of safeties. We already took a safety. Do I want to double up and take a second and a third round safety? I don't think I want to do all that at just one position. Um, I'm fine with reaching into tier three here. If we had not taken a safety, I would be taking one of these safeties, but because we already took a safety, we are not a slave to this board, but it is super useful in figuring out who we should be taking when. So we are uh, reaching over Kobe Bryant um, and Bailey Zappi for Alec Pierce. If you're curious who we would be missing out on, coming right after Alec Pierce. There's cornerback Jalen Armour Davis. We would not take him because there's a higher cornerback on this board um, in Kobe Bryant. Marquise Bell and Tyson Anderson and Smoke Monday, three safeties that we would not be taking because there's two ta- two safeties we have above them. Um, offensive lineman, there's a tackle. U- Luke Gedke out of Central Michigan uh, plays opposite Bernard Raymond. So it would be interesting to have both those guys on our team. Um, but I don't really feel like doubling up on tackle. I'd like to take a tackle and a guard if we're going to double dip at offensive line. Defensive tackle, Fedarian Mathis out of Alabama. That one, maybe we shouldn't pass up on. All right, because I think defensive line is pretty important. We already took a swing at wide receiver. You could argue that we need more than one wide receiver in this draft. But I would say there's not a lot of defensive linemen left that you feel are top prospects. In fact, there's only two top 100 uh, defensive tackles on my board left. That's Fideri Mathis and then Ohio State's Haskell Garrett. And even though they're both in the top top 100, I have them in different tiers. I don't think that they are um, very comparable in terms of their value. I'd have rather have Fideri any day over Haskell. Haskell. Like Haskell, but just they're in different tiers. A lot of safeties. We already took a safety. Kellen Deesh, the tackle out of Arizona State. Yeah, I, I mean, I really think that it's coming down to... Um, actually, I, I lied. Haskell Garrett and Federian Mathis are in the same tier on my board. Uh, but Federian is five spots ahead of him. So if we're going to take a defensive tackle, we're taking Federian. It, it comes down to, do you, do you take Alec Pierce here, or do you take Federian Mathis? And... I just, I don't know. I mean, you had to you had to evaluate what you've already done with your roster. You brought in Jerron Reed and Sammy Watkins, who I think are way more similar in terms of value than Packer fans want to admit. I, I kind of think we need to shore up the defensive line a little bit here. You know, a third round pick at defensive tackle definitely might be the kind of thing that would push you over the edge more than another wide receiver would. But at the same time, you have to you have to look at who else we have. We you know if 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 Jerron Reed doesn't pan out, do we have defensive line bodies who are going to get the job done? If George Pickens doesn't pan out, do we have wide receiver bodies who are going to get the job done? I think you need to take more swings at wide receiver because you don't have any reason to have confidence that your first round pick is going to pan out in year one. So. Take two guys, since you just don't have bodies who can play. I mean, you got Randall Cobb, you got Sammy Watkins, you got Alan Lazard. But if Amari Rogers and George Pickens are not contributors in 2022, man, it'd be nice to have another guy that you took a swing on here. So, I don't know. I I think you can't really go wrong either way, taking Alec Pierce or Federian Mathis. But, you know what? We don't have to take a pick here. There's no more picks in the top 100, you know, in, in our first three rounds. So, you know, we don't have to decide who <laughs> who we're taking. We got to this point. These are the players on the board. You have your tiers. Uh, Mathis and Alec Pierce are both in the same tier, so you're not reaching there. It's just a matter of positional preference. Do I think that Alec Pierce is probably a slightly better player than Federia Mathis? I do. That's why I have him at 57 and I have Mathis at 65, but you're only talking about eight spots difference. And that is well within the margin of error for me. 
This is why I chunked it up into tiers. I don't I don't think there's margin of error here with the tiers in the same way that I do with the individual number rankings. So I don't think there's a wrong pick here between Pierce or Mathis. Um, you know, you could question whether we made the right decision to take Brian Cook, the safety, with our second second round pick. Because there's two more safeties available here who we think are really good value at pick 92. But we didn't know they were going to be here. And I do think that Cook is a much better safety prospect than Brad Hawkins or Leon O'Neill. And by the way, you'll find Brian Cook much higher on the average big board than uh, Hawkins or O'Neill. In fact, uh, a lot of people would say that I put Hawkins and O'Neill too early. I feel comfortable with them here. I like them here. But uh, these are the kinds of things you got to think about. And this is why when you're watching the Packers next week doing their draft, they're going to reach for some guys in your eyes. They're going to they're going to go after players that you're saying that makes no sense. You know, uh, this guy is right here and you didn't take him. You took this other guy. Yeah, that's because the other guy was probably way higher on their board than the guy you like. Especially if that happens with. You know. Within the same position, if they take one guy at a position, you're like, oh my gosh, why did you take him when the other guy at the same position was right there? Obviously, that's a lot easier to understand, but but still, you know, you you, you look at how this board goes, and it, it's, it was really interesting watching the draft happen because there's guys going in the first round, again, that I had in the third or fourth round as prospects. And it's not just me. Like I said, the NFL scouts are watching the exact same thing happen. They're going, oh, man, I'm glad that they uh, took that guy right there because we we definitely didn't want him with our next pick. I think about uh, in 2020, you know, there, there's video footage that was released inside the Vikings and Eagles draft rooms. And first of all, with the Eagles, you're watching one of the old, one of the old man scouts. <laughs> in the room is arguing with GM Howie Roseman. He was so frustrated. Don't take Jalen Rager, take Justin Jefferson. And uh, Howie overruled him and and took Rager. And you could just see the frustration and the defeat on this old guy's face. And uh, I don't know if he quit. I I doubt he did, but I wouldn't have blamed him if he did. (laughs) You do all this work and you come to your GM and you're like, I am telling you, Jefferson is better than Rager. And you're, and the boss is like, ah, we're going to take Rager. (laughs) <laughs> well, then there's also footage, though, from the Vikings draft room. All right. Eagles get on the clock and uh, uh, GM and, and head coach are sitting there talking. And they are just sure that the Eagles are about to take Justin Jefferson. And they're looking at, well, who's next on our list? And then the pick comes in and it's Rager and they start laughing. Now, I don't think that they are necessarily laughing at the Eagles. I think it's more of a laughing of relief and joy. Like, are you serious? They didn't take Justin. He's available for us. Are you kidding? And then they were obviously super happy to take him, but this is how it's going to go. There's going to be guys, you know, look on my board. I had Bernard Raymond really high. I had him as a tier one prospect. I'm sure you don't, but the Packers have a guy in their tier one who you definitely don't. They probably have multiple guys in their tier one who you definitely don't. And they're going to watch as those players fall much further in the draft than, you know, guys that they have in tier two. And they're going to be thinking about trading up. There's probably going to be a chance that one of those guys is going to be available around their first pick. And they're going to take him and you're going to be frustrated because, well, it's not this, you know, I have a very clearly defined list of five wide receivers who I want them to take at pick 22 if they're available. And the Packers are going, I'm, I'm just telling you, man, Bernard Raymond is a top five prospect for us. And we think he's going to be a stud for a long time for the Packers. Now, not Bernard specifically, but you get what I'm saying. So, anyways, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you had fun uh, doing this exercise. I really enjoyed it. Um, hoping to get uh, defensive tackle pounded out pretty quick here. And really excited for John Meerdink, uh next week. So, tune in. Make sure you don't miss that. That's going to be a blast. I will catch you guys all next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.